Hey, Carl, how are you? I'm well, thanks, Jamie. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join this series of sentientist conversations. And I have to apologize because there's a bit of a storm going over. So if you hear some thunder in the background, it's not the house falling down. It's just a weather system. But it's, yeah, it's great to have the chance to talk to you. You've obviously been in our sentientism Facebook group for a little while now. We've had a few chats and you very kindly put a copy of your book in the post to me as well. So I'm looking forward to reading that. But it's great to have the chance to have a conversation. And as we've talked already, it's a series of conversations about the two deepest philosophical questions to my mind. One is what's real and the other is what matters. And I have a clear bias because I'm framing it in the context of this attempt to recast the term sentientism to say, when it comes to what's real, we should take a naturalistic approach that uses evidence and reason. And when it comes to what matters, the clue is in the name, which have compassion for and moral consideration for all sentient beings, any being that is capable of experiencing. Hence, I summarize it saying it's evidence, reason, and compassion for all sentient beings is a strap line. But I'm talking to people in these conversations who either disagree with that or completely disagree with it. So it'll be fascinating to see where the conversation goes. But before we get to those two questions, for people who don't know your work already, how would you best introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Yeah. So I, you said my name. I'm, my name's Kyle Johansson. I'm a, I guess I'm a professional philosopher. I've been uh, I, have, I have a PhD in philosophy, and I've been teaching philosophy courses at different Canadian universities for a number of years now, and doing academic research in, in philosophy. I do mostly work in political philosophy and in applied ethics, specifically animal ethics and environmental ethics. And I'm in, my recent work has really been focused on uh, the question of wild animal suffering, which for the longest time, not very many people were working on, but it really seems to be taking off right now in, in animal ethics and I'm really happy about that because I think it's really important. Uh, yeah, subject. the topic seems to be picking up. And I, I, my understanding is yours is the, probably the first book to be dedicated to the topic. So congratulations. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to. So I, I will. I'll be modest here. Who's another uh, academic working on, on wild animal suffering. She wrote her dissertation on the subject. And a dissertation is basically a book, but it's just she hasn't uh, yet published it with, with a publishing house. I look forward to seeing that if it ends up being. Published. Well, let's call, you, let's call you the second and call Katya the first. So. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> So the first question we like to ask in these conversations is what's real? And I feel almost embarrassed asking a professional philosopher such a simple question, but often the simplest and the most fundamental questions seem to me to be the most important. So for many of my guests, that's a story about whether they grew up originally in a sort of naturalistic, atheistic science focused context and family and society, or one that was more spiritual or religious or supernatural, and how their philosophy on, I guess, that side of understanding reality has shifted over time, if it has. So I'd love to hear your story, and you can wind the clock back as far as you like. So I'm not religious, I don't think, but I, I, do, I do come from a religious background. And I think there's lots of people who, that's not uncommon, there's a lot of people who probably identify as, as having a, a religious background. I, yeah. I, my background is Roman Catholic, but I don't think I have most of the beliefs that are characteristic of Roman Catholicism, not anymore, at least. Yeah, I, I grew up Roman Catholic, uh, mostly because my mother was Roman Catholic and she really cared about her religion. So she raised me and my siblings to be Roman Catholic. And so I, I attended Catholic schools growing up. I attended a Catholic elementary school and a Catholic high school. I think growing up, I did believe in the sort of standard Christian God, mm. um, but I, I didn't really like being uh, Roman Catholic that much. I found it very restrictive. I didn't like having to wear uniforms. So at, at, at high school, I had to wear a uniform every day and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to wear jeans and a t-shirt or whatever. Yeah. Teenage stuff. I didn't like having to pray all the time. It's fruitless to me. I didn't, it wasn't obvious that I was doing anything. I didn't like having to attend mass on Sundays. And I, I really didn't like the, the conservative values that I was being in. I, I, yeah. I, th I think I liked the ethical discussions that popped up in Catholic circles and, I, and sometimes sermons that, that priests, priests were giving would have some discussion of morality. And I thought that the, I, I remember being impressed by that, by this, the fact that eth eth ethics was really being thought about. In, yeah, in, by Catholics, but I didn't like some of the some of the messages. So, like in particular, the very sort of conservative attitude towards sex that the Roman Cat the Roman Catholics have. It struck me for uh, even even as a, a relatively young person, I, I quickly discovered that this just didn't seem plausible. It didn't seem plausible to think that like condoms were somehow morally problematic, or that <laughs> yeah. abortions, for the early term abortions, were morally problematic. Like as soon as I learned a little bit about what we know about fetuses and the likelihood of sentience at, at an early point. I was just like, why, why would that matter? Why would it matter to abort an, an insentient or non-sentient fetus? Um, and was it, were you challenging the sort of fact base of these things more and saying, look, it doesn't make sense because it doesn't correspond with the reality? Or were you more concerned about the, the harm that might be caused from these values? Or was it a bit of both? I think, I think, yeah, so now it's probably a bit of both. But in the past, I think it just struck me as false. It's just, it yeah. to me like I was being, like false beliefs were being conveyed to me. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, and, um, and what was the process you went through? Of, yeah, you, you, you believed you started to push back against or feel some friction against the restrictions and yeah. ask some questions. Interesting to know what process you went through of getting to the point where you said, I'm no longer a Roman Catholic and how that was for you both intellectually and emotionally, but also in terms of family and society. And Right. I don't think, yeah, it, I, I don't know if there was a point at, at, at where there was any particular point at which I just decided that I'm merely someone with a Catholic background and not yeah. a Roman Catholic anymore. I think just gradually, just talking to my parents and my other family members, there's just this collective realization amongst all of us, even amongst my, so my mom was, my mother was the person who really motivated our, our cap or really pushed for our Catholic upbringing. But over time, even her views seem to have changed a bit. I think she still believes in God and cares about her religion, but she doesn't even, she doesn't take it nearly as seriously as she used to. And yeah, I, just say, I don't know. It seems to me like we all just changed. We all just stopped caring. My entire family just stopped caring that much. At least my very immediate family stopped caring so much about religion. We stopped even bothering going to church. My parent, my mom's views seem to become increasingly more liberal over time. I don't know. It was just this weird process of yeah. uh, positive change. Actually, I, I think. Yeah. It just faded. Yeah. 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 And how did that, uh, was there ever a, uh, a link between that side of your thinking and I guess your, the way you thought about ethics and morality, which is the second subject we'll come on to, or did they even in those days seem a bit, more distinct and separate. Sure. So I think for me, there was something of a connection between my, my moral convictions and my religion, but I don't, I think it was just a causal connection um, mm. rather than a philosophical connection. So it's not like I, I believed in a certain set of morals because I was Catholic and because I identified God as like the source of moral authority or something like that. I don't think that was ever true for me. I think what is, the commandments yeah. were written down therefore. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was never, that, yeah, that was never really my my thinking. I, I, that wasn't really part of my beliefs. But what was the case is that just being raised Catholic and going to church mo- a lot of Sundays and because I was in Catholic schools too, there were a lot of masses and, and whatnot that I attended there. And I, I think just that upbringing involved discussions of morality. And I did, and I, again, I, didn't, I often disagreed with the beliefs that were being conveyed, but I did end up thinking about morality a lot. And it ended up just, I think something that was just impressed upon me was that it's important to be talking about and thinking about morality. And yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And it ended, that ended up actually, yeah, so that ended up motivating me to, to adopt philosophy. So I, I ended up majoring in philosophy when I went to university. I, I attended York University, which is a, a university in Toronto, uh, not too far from where I grew up. I grew up in, in Brampton, which is about 40 minutes, 40 minute drive northwest of Toronto. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm Canadian. And yeah, when I went there, I, I ended up deciding to major in philosophy, but not because philosophy itself interested me interested me that much. I think I ended up developing a real interest in philosophy by majoring in it, but I wasn't interested in philosophy broadly. I was interested narrowly in ethics and ethics just happened to be a subfield of philosophy. And so I ended up deciding to major in philosophy for that reason. And I think I was initially interested in ethics in the first place, probably because of my Catholic upbringing and the discussions of ethics that, that were part of that upbringing. Yeah. Interesting. And it sounds like I'm guessing that as we come on to this second question about what matters morally, which again is a Another breathtakingly naive, basic question to ask of a professional philosopher. But the because you didn't have that strong link between the two, I'm guessing that as your religious convictions f- faded away, it didn't necessarily feel like there was a big gap. So for some of my guests, it has left a bit of a vacuum, right? They've, they've moved away from a religion because the facts don't seem to add up and because they have an intuitive, you know, rejection of some of the ethics, whether it's sexism or the caste discrimination or, you know, cruel punishments or threatening children with hell or whatever it is, they have some rejection of those ethics, but then they really struggle to work out, okay, if I don't have the list of commandments or the Quran or a God threatening to punish me, what what do I have? I'm guessing you didn't have that sort of, that gap, but it would be interesting to know, I guess there's two parts to this question. What is in the absence of a sort of supernatural worldview what does ground your ethics if they're grounded at all? And again, how has that changed as you grew up and as you studied philosophy and where you've got to now? And a second part of the question is about moral considerability and okay, which entities and which types of entities count in ethics? But um, yeah, maybe, I don't know if you want to start with the first one, but we may well blend into the second. Yeah, sure. So I'm not too much of a meta-ethicist or anything like that, but I have thought a bit about it. I think that, I, so I, I do think that morality is more or less objective matter. Actually, no, I, I'm going to say it is an objective matter. I think sometimes it's hard to figure out mm. what our moral obligations are. So there's ep- some, certain epistemic barriers associated with trying to figure out what the core requirements of morality are. But I do think it's objective. And I think a lot of what we, the way we talk about, about morality presupposes that 
we think of it as objective. Even if some of us are relativists, we seem to be acting like it's objective. Mm-hmm. Even relativists are behaving like they believe morality is objective. So for example, arguing about morality seems to presuppose that there are right answers. Why would you argue about, about a moral claim, about the appeal of a moral claim, or about whether a moral claim is justified? unless there were some answer, some right answer there. Now, and, even, and even quite strong relativists, when presented with a really egregious example of needless suffering, will normally back away and at least implicitly recognize that there are, there are some limits to relativism and therefore there must be something else, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Or they'll really struggle to give some sort of story, yeah, yeah. Um, mm. uh, as to why admitting certain things are wrong is nonetheless compatible with relativism. I, I, I don't know. But, but yeah, but I, I think it'd be probably be a mistake to think that that objectivity. Okay, so I guess two, two, maybe two nuances associated with my, at least my view of morality's objectivity. One, one is that so I think some people who think that they're relativists or subjectivists, they're confusing it. I'm not talking about professional philosophers. I'm talking about mm. maybe sort of lay people who think of themselves as relativists. I think they're sometimes confusing relativism with, with contextualism. So just because it's okay so just because morality is objective doesn't mean that everyone's duties are identical so if you look at one person who's in a particular set of in a particular context and another person in a different context the fact that they're situated in different contexts will have a big impact on what their duties are so yeah. parents owe duties to their children that strangers don't owe the, the duties of a parent are different in content than the duties of a non-parent yeah and there's, that's, that's about the context not about a relativistic yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And so in order for in order for objectivism to make sense, all we need to be able to say is that if there's some particular duty, that say duty X, and um and one owes that duty in a particular set of con in a particular context Z, we can be objectivist so long as we think that any person in context Z would owe duty X. So yeah, couldn't contextual duties just need to be universal in the sense that anyone who found themselves in the relevant context would have the rel- would have the relevant yeah. duty. Got it. Yeah. So it's objective within, the, within a particular, con- well, it's, it's consistent within a particular context, but it doesn't say all contexts are the same, of course. Yeah. Although we, any contextualist would probably admit that certain duties tend to be fairly universal across contexts. So like the duty not to kill yeah. another person is probably there. I think there are justified instances of killing, but they're very, they're rare. And usually anyone's going to owe that duty in, in almost any context, the duty not yeah. to kill. But, and then, yeah. Okay. So that's one caveat. Another caveat would be, so sometimes I think people assume that if you think moral claims are objective or that morality is comprised of, of, of objective beliefs, that, that you're therefore committed to some sort of form of moral realism, that you're committed to the mm. claim that there's some external reality that makes moral claims true by virtue of those claims corresponding to that external reality. Yeah. So that these weird spooky kind of moral facts out there that look very different from regular old empirical facts because they're not exactly accessible through empirical analysis. Or if they are, it's in a very different kind of weird way. Their properties are probably that would be different from the properties of regular empirical facts. I think, I, I, yeah, so I don't think that you have to be a moral, real, moral realist in order to think that morality is objective. And actually, moral realism, it sounds a little bit like a religious worldview because you're positing spooky entities. So I think that uh, it's, we, could, we could probably say that morality is objective by virtue of its association with human, with, of, of its association with practical reason, something about practical reason makes it the case that some that certain a certain set of moral claims are objectively the case. And uh, there's different stories we could tell about that. It might have something to do with consistency. There might be something incoherent about the thought that if I'm in circumstance Z and O duty X, and circumstance Z generates duty X, there might be something really inconsistent about thinking that other people don't owe the same duty when they're in that circumstance too. So there might be something like, yeah, something like coherence or consistency might part, partly ground the objectivity of, of moral claims. We, we might also try and say, think that it's grounded in a connection with human flourishing or, or with the good. So mm-hmm. social cooperation is probably made possible by everyone adhering to at least some sort of basic minimal set of, of moral duties. And yeah. you could say that you know, you, it's objectively true that you owe those duties or that you ought to perform those duties because when people perform those duties, we all benefit from it. And there's, yeah, there's different versions of that, different ways of trying to connect uh, morality to flourishing. But uh, yeah, some, some sort of story like that probably has a role to play in explaining the objectivity of morality. Yeah. And I think I end up personally, I end up in, a, in an amateur way in a similar sort of place. And I think the idea of pure moral realism, that there's some sort of platonic tr- moral truths floating out there that we're trying to discover, it doesn't make sense to me. I think before there was any sentient being in the universe or on our world, there wasn't any morality at all because there was nothing to conceive of it. There was nothing to construct it. There was no possible, no possibility for anything to be experiencing suffering or flourishing. So I'm not that sort of a hard moral realist, but at the same time, I do ground my thinking about morality and a naturalistic understanding of the world, which I do think is you know highly likely to be objectively real. And so in that sense, the really common 
sense way of grounding it comes back to ultimately, well, I know I don't like suffering. I'm pretty sure you don't like either suffering either. And morality in a way is just my choice to care about that. It, it's grounded naturalistically. It's not relativistic. It's not supernatural, but it's also not perfectly morally real in a externally defined sense either. So it's a bit, I may be quite pragmatic, but yeah, it comes back down to needlessly causing suffering is bad and flourishing in life are are good. So (laughs) something along those lines, it's a middle ground. And would it, would it be true to say that as you think about realism, object, whether things are objective or not, that, that you also link back to experience in some way as being the sort of raw material of morality? What's the ultimate point of morality? Is it grounded in suffering and flourishing or something else? Or do you have a different conception of what the base is? So I think my view about this is that there's multiple fundamental values in in morality. And and yeah, I won't worry about the status of those values. Those We could just say those values are somewhere in our conceptual framework, and that conceptual framework is connected to our ability to flourish, whatever. Or maybe those values correspond to something external, but I don't want to commit myself to that, some sort of external moral reality. But yeah, so there's multiple fundamental values in our framework. I think that some of those values are goods values, and some of those values are function values. And um, so the goods values would be values that have a connection but with, well, with our good. So welfare is a goods value. Resources are a goods value, but probably not a fundamental one. They mm. probably say that they have instrumental value, though we, there might be some cases where something that looks a lot like a resource, maybe it makes sense to treat it as fundamental. So physical resources, yeah, like men, co- co- cognitive resources and bodily resources, may, maybe, that's more, maybe there's more, a better case to be made for them being fundamentally important and not just instrumentally important. But but anyways, other goods values. So some of the things you might find in an objective list theory of well-being could be goods values. So like health or good social relationships. I don't know how long the list of specifically fundamental goods values will be. Yeah. Um, certainly welfare sounds like one, but I think probably some of the things you would find in an objective list theory should probably count as fundamental. I don't think that anytime welfare, so subjective welfare understood as like hedonic experiences of mm. pleasure. I don't think that pleasure and pain are uh, any time that would say a gain in pleasure competes with some other something else, say a, a preference or say health or something like that. I, I don't know if, if pleasure always wins out. I mean, maybe sometimes tr- pleasure could be trumped by other goods. So that, yeah, anyway, so that's one kind of value. Another type of value, I think, is values that attach themselves to goods and indicate what we ought to do with, mm. with what that matter to us. I think that one type of function value would be one that requires um, a fair distribution of whatever it is that's good. We might think that welfare really matters that means that everyone should have an equal opportunity for good welfare. And uh, yeah, these function values attach themselves to good values and direct us to do certain things with them in light of in light of the value of those goods values. Another kind of goods value might be something like efficiency, or I don't know if, if beneficent is a function value, it might be. But so one, one kind of function value would be a, a value that requires us to increase the amount of what's good. Mm, yeah. I, I think I, in, in my political philosophical work, I've usually called that value efficiency. But so we don't just want it. We don't just want a fair distribution of whatever's good. We also want there to just be more of whatever's good. Yeah. Um, it would be bad. So we don't want to level down. We wouldn't want to have everyone have an incredibly low amount, but low but equal amount of whatever it is that's good. We'd want everyone to have a half decent amount of whatever it is that's good. That's and I'm sure that I'm sure that morality is more complicated than just this. But and, and res- I'm not sure where respect fits in. Actually, so I think okay, another kind of value probably would be constraint type value. Ontologists are very concerned with constraints on on the promotion of what's good constraints on states of affairs consequentialist oriented values so for so re, and i think respect is one one such constraint sometimes increasing what's good or fairly even fairly distributing what's good can run up against a respect for respect, respect for individuals you might have to harm someone in order to yeah. increase the amount of the value and the, so and so respect places certain limits on what we can do to, when we're trying to fairly distribute what's good or increase the amount of what's good Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. And one of the one of the good things about the way I'm trying to frame sentientism is that it, it's radically philosophically pluralistic. So it doesn't suggest that you need to, you know, follow Peter Singer down a utilitarian path or Regan down a rights path or Christine Korsgaard down a sort of adapted Kantian version that extends the moral moral circle more broadly. It just says what we've got to do is get the moral our moral scope right in terms of the entities we include in our consideration. But then after that, there's an enormous richness of different ways of thinking about value and trade-offs and different sets of interests and preferences. So many different people who might call themselves sentientists will disagree with what I'm about to say. But my personal view 
I really struggle to find any of the things that are mentioned as different sources of value that don't ultimately come back to the quality of a sentient experience. And that's partly because I don't just think of it in terms of a fairly narrow hedonic definition of pain and pleasure. I think of it as just any qualitatively positive or negative experience. So that could include existential angst, a sense of loss, a sense of wonder and awe and meaning and richness, almost any good or bad sentient experience. And it feels to me like whether they're resources, goods, physical goods, some of those other constructed values and social values or values about justice and fairness and distribution, to my mind, all have enormous value, but they do seem to be instrumentally, ultimately, because of their impact on the quality of experience of the, yeah. of the sentient being. In a way, I'd find myself probably agreeing with you on maybe distribution and fairness and respect and dignity but I still ultimately think that the reason I'd agree with you is because they have a some form of generally positive effect on the quality of sentient experiences. So almost everything comes back to that ultimate grounding for me. But I may well be, you know, missing something there or and arguably whether you see there's instrumental or intrinsic value in something doesn't necessarily matter that much if you agree it's valuable. But this is Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Whether these so that right now this is a sort of meta theoretical question that we're looking at what's fundamentally because we're, we're we're agreeing about what's valuable but we're just the disagreements about the way in which it's valuable yeah and yeah it's yeah. a little hard to figure out what the pragmatic consequences of disagreements exactly like and whether, whether it really matters that much yeah but yeah. and maybe so, maybe that's a good time to come on to the, the the most pertinent question which is really about that scope of moral consideration because you and i will know people who are richly compassionate ethical people but they still have that compassion is bounded or conditional in a certain way. And in that, if you exclude certain entities from your moral consideration, even compassionate people can sanction or excuse or ignore plenty of harm and suffering as well. So that would be another thing. It would be interesting to know your story about the first time you started thinking about who counts and what counts ethically and what journey you've gone through now and, and how do you set the scope of moral consideration at the moment, you're currently thinking. Yeah. So I'm, uh, so I, I would normally say I'm a sentientist here, but that's because I'm used to using the word sentientism a little bit differently from, from yeah. how you find it in your, in, in your podcast and, and in this movement that you're trying, that you're building. And so I've normally used the word sentientism to mean sentiocentrism. It's, it's helpful that you've distinguished those two things. I hadn't realized that sometimes philosophers use the word sentientism to mean, I, I think, so in, in my experience, usually animal ethics philosophers have been using the term sentientism just to mean sentiocentrism. Yeah. But I think, you're, but but you, I think I've heard you say in some of your, in, in one of your videos that you found instances where sentientism was used to mean something broader, to mean sentiocentrism plus naturalism. Uh, I think you said Singer and Richard Ryder have sometimes used the term that way. So it sounds it's good that you're distinguishing these terms. If sometimes sentientism is being used in, in an ambiguous way, or, or yeah, yeah, and I think um, um, I think both Richard Ryder and Peter Singer did use it in a naturalistic context originally, but they were still only taking a naturalistic approach to assessing sentience and determining its implications. And then, you know, and within Richard Ryder's context, it was explicitly in some circumstances set against a supernatural or religious way of thinking. It was grounded in the science of understanding what sentience is likely to be and which entities are likely to be sentient. So it was quite, I think, for the, both of those guys, reasonably explicitly naturalistic, but they didn't say, implied a broader naturalism across all domains of knowledge. And in a way, that's one of the things I'm suggesting we, we consider doing now, because I think you're right, it, it became almost synonymous with sentiocentrism. And I guess the suggestion I'm making, which may or not, may not be taken up, is that we consider the, here's a spectrum of anthropocentrism, centriocentrism, biocentrism, ecocentrism, if you like, none of which say anything about naturalism or supernaturalism. They're just about which you know, classes of entities count in your moral, moral consideration. And where anthropocentrism, you might then look at secular humanism as the explicitly naturalistic version of that says we care about humans, but in a naturalistic context, not because we're made in the image of God or because God gave us souls, but because we are human beings and that's the source of our value. In that context, when you get to sentiocentrism, I'm suggesting we use the term sentientism rather than as a synonym to be the explicitly naturalistic version of it, which says we have, we have a sentiocentric compassion, but again, not for any supernatural or religious or revealed reason, but because we have a naturalistic understanding of 
you know, the universe and the world and the things within it. So that's it's a suggestion, but you know, how, yeah, to, I, how things will develop, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'd be interested to know. So when I was thinking a bit about, about your podcast and about the way you use the term sentientism, and I think that having watched enough now, it's clear that you've never, I don't think you've ever tried to suggest that you were giving a report of definition of the term sentientism. You weren't trying to say, this is how the term is used by everyone who's using the term. I don't think. And so that, that's good because it might not be the best report of definition. I think that maybe... At least my impression is that most animal ethicists use it in a more narrow way than, than you do. But if the thought of here is that you're doing a bit of philosophy, so you want to say that perhaps something about that as a matter of, of logic or consistency, sentiocentrism is really committed to naturalism. And thus, our, we should use the term sentientism not just to mean sentiocentrism, but sentiocentrism plus naturalism because of sentiocentrism's logic, centrism's logical commitments, I think, or something like that. Then I think that that would be a good sort of philosophical case for broadening the way the term sentientism is used yeah and, 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 so, and the um, last thing i want to do yeah. is take liberties with a term that is is understood in a different way but i guess part of my rationale as well is that a sentiocentric compassion for me isn't sufficient in pragmatic terms to give us a good positive moral outcome because someone can easily have a sentiocentric concern for all beings that have the capacity to experience suffering but that can be overridden by some form of supernatural or superordinate morality that still makes your compassion con conditional or constrained. It might put something as more important the, than the experiences of sentient beings. But if you believe that ultimately obedience to a God or a set of commandments is more important than the entities you have compassion for, that can still justify and excuse a great deal of harm. So it's partly coming out of that pr pragmatic concern that, you know, if you look at humanism, I think that one has a naturalistic grounding and has a you know commitment to universal human ethics and human rights, but has a problem in that it stops with the human. A sentiocentrism sets the moral scope appropriately, in my view, because I think all sentient beings you know warrant moral consideration. But for it to be more complete as a epistemological and moral worldview, it needs to have that naturalistic aspect as well. So that's, I guess, what I'm suggesting we almost reuse yeah. the term sentientism for as an analog to humanism. But right, yeah. Oh, and, and if I can add something, and you can decide yeah, whether, or not you, whether or not you agree, with, we think these are good arguments. But so if you have a sentiocentric view, and let's say a sentiocentrism is the view that the possession of sentience is necessary and sufficient for moral considerability. Uh, mm. Sentient beings are members of the moral community. They're intrinsically morally valuable. Non-sentient beings are not members of the moral community. They're not intrinsically morally valuable. Let's say that's what centrism means. I think that sort of analytically entails that at least some religious views about the scope of the moral community ha would have to be wrong. Like you're, you'd be contradict. So you'd be con suppose, yeah, you'd be contradicting yourself if you're a sentiocentric, and yet you also said that you were committed to the view that the human soul is what in is is the correct criterion for inclusion in the moral community. Human yeah. beings have a soul. Non-human beings don't, so human beings get to be part of the moral community. Those are just two incompatible views of conflict, yeah. And then uh, another thing that occurs to me too is that, and I don't think this is a logical commitment really, but maybe it's, it's more pragmatic. If you're a sentiocentric, presumably you think that we can use science to figure out which beings are sentient and which ones are not. So you must, you, presumably you think that, there's, that, that it's an open question to some extent, which beings are sentient, which ones are not. We know that we're sentient, but yeah. like, also there are some hard cases, some hard human cases where it's a little unclear whether a human being is sentient. So at what point does the fetus become sentient is yeah. a, science, a question we need to figure out using empirical science. We might want wonder whether people who've certain, suffered certain brain injuries are still sentient after those yeah. brain injuries. And then when it comes to animals, we're pretty sure that vertebrates are sentient, but there's lots of questions about inver invertebrate sentience. And yeah, and the way that we would figure this out is with science. And that's a very sort of naturalistic view to have about, about figuring out the scope of the moral community. I, I suppose you could be sentiocentric and still and somehow deny that science is the way to figure out which beings are sentient, but there'd be something very weird about, about thinking that. Yeah, um, some challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, yeah, thank you. No, that's really useful. And in your journey, would you describe yourself, as you said, as a sentiocentrist now? That's how you set the scope. How did you get to that? How did you get to that point? Because it's certainly not how most people grow up in our default cultures. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I guess when I, I enjoyed philosophy enough when I was taking it during my undergrad to, to decide to take it further. And I did, I did a PhD in philosophy at Queen's University. And I certainly didn't foresee becoming sentiocentric when I did a PhD in philosophy. But I just I happened to take an animal ethics course in, my, in the first year of my PhD program. It was taught by Will Kimlicka. And this was actually the first time that Will Kimlicka had taught an animal ethics course. Him and his partner, Sue Donaldson, had, yeah. just, been, had just finished writing the manuscript for Zoopolis. And he decided to teach a course that was basically just teaching the manuscript and the, and the various articles that he and Sue had been reading when preparing the manuscript. And, and Zoopolis is about a bunch of topics. But prior to taking that course, I'd never thought about animal ethics at all. 
And so it was taking that course that got me thinking about animals. And I think that ultimately it's why I ended up deciding that there's just no way we can get around the conclusion that um, sentientism is the correct mm. that criterion for inclusion in the moral community. And I, I mentioned earlier that I'm, I, I think I'm probably something of a pluralist when it comes to what the elements of the good are. But I think that yeah. the, even the other, so the non-welfare elements, I think that a condition for them to count as good in a morally relevant way is sentience. Health, for example, I don't think that can be something that's good for a being in a morally significant way, unless a being is capable of caring about whether they're healthy or caring about yeah. the effects that their health has on them. So even when we include like objective things, I think a precondition for their moral importance is the possession of sentience. So I think, yeah, that's, yeah. Really, that's really how I got to where I'm at right now over time. Yeah. And I think that's partly where the philosophical pluralism I'm suggesting um, for sentientism comes from in that you might take a rights view, right? And you might think about the right to be harmed. Well, for that right to be relevant, you need to have the capacity to experience being harmed. So again, I think you're right, whether you take a utilitarian or a consequentialist view that just sees the quality of sentient experience as an end in itself being of value, or whether you take a rights approach or whether you take ends in, ends in themselves approach yeah. it still feels to me like sent, sentience is the use is the qualifier for exclusion or inclusion it still works almost whichever philosophical yeah. or ethical system you, you use and was that how closely did your intellectual shift happen about your expansion of moral consideration and i guess the practical considerations of that the link between animal products and food and other aspects of your life was that a difficult sort of laggy process to go through? Because it was for me, it took me a long, long while. Or was it more of a light bulb moment? No, it, it took a while. Yeah. I, it's not like I didn't, I, I don't think I became a sentiocentric person immediately after taking the, the course I mentioned. That's of course just got me thinking about things. It, it took, I guess it took a couple of years before I, I decided that sentiocentrism was right. And also before I decided that veganism is a, a moral requirement if sentiocentrism is right. And so I, I ended up going vegan during my PhD as well. Part, part of this process for me was, yeah, taking that course and thinking, but a lot of it too was just that I was surrounded by people who supported, who supported my change in beliefs and my change in, in um, lifestyle. So I saw, there were other people around me who were vegan who I could talk to about going vegan and about the health concerns I had about it at the time and, and who thought that going vegan was great and who provided me with social support. And so that, that was that, that was makes really such a difference. Yeah. So it sounds like it was a pragmatically and socially a reasonably easy transition to make to you. Is that fair? Yeah, I think the main thing was just was just changing habits. Changing yeah. one's habits is always difficult. And so once I made a real commitment to changing my habits and, and it was a gradual, it was gradual for me. I ended up deciding I gotta go vegan, but I can't do it all at once. And so I just started cutting things out and over I can't remember exactly how long it took. It took maybe eight months or nine months or something, but eventually I just cut out all the stuff that wasn't vegan and yeah. And go out there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And one of the other distinctions, if there's one obvious challenge to a sentientist or a sentiocentric view is you've gone too far, only humans matter or humans matter so much more that we need to almost disregard certain classes of non-human animals. So that's one challenge. And I think you and I would reject that. The other one is sentientism or sentiocentrism doesn't go far enough. And I mentioned earlier, biocentrism, ecocentrism, holism, where people will want to grant intrinsic moral value or intrinsic value of some sort to you know, non-sentient things or things that we think are highly unlikely to be sentient, plants, rocks, rivers, trees, ecosystems, species, Gaia, you know, things we're pretty confident don't experience uh, anything at all. What's your thoughts about going beyond sentiocentrism? And do you think those things have instrumental or do they also potentially have some intrinsic value? And how do you think about that balance? Yeah, so I think that certainly some things in the environment are instrumentally valuable. Yeah. But okay, so this isn't, I, I don't know, I don't know if this is an answer to your question, but it's the kind of answer I want to give right now. I've been thinking about <laughs> Go for it. Um, I think that the more expansive views, the different kinds of biocentrism and the sort of whole, so there's a bunch of these views out there, right? So there's individualistic biocentrism that sees individual life as intrinsically morally valuable. So yeah. you know, pot, potted plants and blades of grass and whatever else, trees. And then there's the sort of different kinds of holism, which you could maybe call biocentric forms of holism. So yeah. the, those different forms of holism might say that species are intrinsically valuable. So we're not talking about the individual members of the species, but the, the groups are yeah. intrinsically valuable. And then another view of view, ecocentrism would say ecosystems and the relations that sustain them are, are intrinsically valuable. So I think that views like this are, I'm really skeptical of them. And I, my, my skepticism is that I, I think that they probably are a kind of veneer used to cover up what in practice is really just an anthropocentric way of thinking about the environment. Yeah. And, and you can really see this, you can see this in part just in the literature, because there's this literature about these views. 
that debates whether or not these things are intrinsically valuable or whether they are just intrinsically valued. Yes. And there's really good reasons to think that they're just being intrinsically valued. And, and the reasons for wanting to intrinsically value them tend to be very anthropocentric reasons to, for imputing or con- seeing them as intrinsically valuable, even if there's no good epistemic reasons for thinking they really are intrinsically valuable. There's all these anthropocentric kind of pragmatic reasons. Because if you, like uh, Arnie Nace, for example, argues that if you identify with lots of things, see things, lo- lots of different things as intrinsically valuable, you are thereby more mature and you'll live like a happier life if you do that. But that's just like a self-interested reason for doing this. And it's not, it's not epistemic. Like that's not actually a reason for thinking they really have intrinsically valuable, intrinsic value. It's just a reason for taking a certain psychological attitude towards these things. And it looks very anthropocentric to me. But the other thing too is that, so there's this view in, in environmental ethics called environmental pragmatism. And environmental pragmatists want to get away from these moral status debates because they think that in practice, they don't really cash out in, in any important way. They think that anthropocentric views about the environment that see just either exist. It's okay. Now, one, one kind of view in, in environmental ethics is just that human beings are what ulti- ultimately matters and also future human beings are what yeah. ultimately yeah. matter. And because we matter and our descendants will matter, we have good reasons to care about the environment. Environmental pragmatists think that kind of view doesn't in practice really come apart from the different kinds of biocentrism out there, that the practical conclusions that follow tend to be the same. Like we're all just interested in environmental protection or something like that. And if that's right, and I'm going to say, let's say that's right, that there's very little difference in practice. I think that's really scary because expanding the moral community should have really big practical implications. If you think about what expanding the moral community did in the human case, yeah. it, it meant we had to, you know, that slavery needs to be abolished. Women need to be given the right to vote. And a whole bunch more stuff that hasn't happened yet is going to have to happen yeah. in light of the fact that all human beings are, are moral equals. Okay, so ex- including all human beings in the moral community has had dramatic practical implications. And, and some of those practical implications haven't even been realized yet. There's still things yeah. we need to do that we haven't yeah, done. Completely. But, and yet somehow in environmental ethics, expanding the moral community doesn't do anything. It, having the most expansive view that includes blades of grass and ecosystems and everything doesn't come apart in practice from having an anthropocentric view. Uh, how, that just seems crazy to me. And but I think that really, I'm tempted to think that all these different kinds of biocentrism are really just a progressive veneer that's trying to make anthropocentric views about the environment look more, look progressive when they're not. Yeah. I and, share and that. I share that skepticism. Yeah. Carry on. Sorry. Yeah. And, and then once we get to sentiocentrism, right? Initially, I think environmental ethicists and, and animal ethics ethicists maybe didn't think there was much tension between sentiocentrism and the other views with respect to environmental practice, but it's becoming increasingly clear that there is a uh, tension. So yeah. you think that animals matter, you think that animal suffering matters, and you take seriously how pervasive wild animal suffering is, Death, it seems like there's a pretty good case for intervening in nature in different ways. And, uh, and that, that doesn't, that a lot of environmental ethicists find that very uncomfortable, yeah. but that's moral progress. You have to interfere with things. <laughs> like you said, there's implications, right? If the decisions you're making are meaningful, there's got to be implications. And I share your skepticism about the anthropocentric view, right? Because when you work back from a lot of those ecocentric or biocentric or systemic or holistic perspectives, they do feel very anthropocentric. It's, nature is important because I like looking at it, or nature is important because as a human, I need a series of ecosystem services to enable me to prosper, or threats from climate change and environmental destruction is going to be a worse place for me to live, right? And so many of those things are framed as a generous moral consideration, but really are just anthropocentric. And one of the ways you can see that is because while people have pushed that moral consideration theoretically very broadly, they're still continuing to exclude vast tranches of very obviously sentient beings that are part of those ecosystems. The the pattern, and I'm I'm giving a bit of a caricature here, goes along the lines of, look, I'm concerned with humans and I'm conceptually at least concerned with the human species, not all humans. Because we are at threat of climate change and environmental destruction, I now care about these ecosystems in a very broad, generous, holistic way. But because I care so broadly now and ascribe moral value to things that are sentient, that aren't sentient, to plants, to rocks, to rivers, to trees, but I still need to survive, it's fine for me to have my bacon sandwich every morning. Right? And, and again, it just you're like, ah, I can see where you're coming from, right? Really, this is just an anthropocentric concern that's enabling you to continue you know, doing what you want to do. And in a way, many people have just dressed it up as something that's much more generous than it really is. And that really is the center of the environmental movement uh, today, that it's very broadly concerned. And I think even a sentiocentrist would also have a very rich environmental concern because the environment is so important to the experiences of all sentient beings. Of course, we share that, but not to the detriment of the sentient beings. And one obvious class that falls very naturally within a sentiocentric worldview 
and is the focus of most animal advocates and animal ethics people and vegans is farmed animals. Of course, when you can see the, the commission of injustice that we perpetuate on them is breathtaking and shocking and sickening. So it's obvious that once you take a sentiocentric view, you'll have a pretty strong view about animal farming and fishing. But you already touched on another tension between the environmental and ecocentric perspective and sentiocentric one, which is the experiences of wild animals, hence, you know, hence your recent book. So it, again, it would be interesting to know at what point did you break through that boundary as well and start recognizing, okay, it's not just about animal farming and fishing and the harm that humans do deliberately. There's actually a wider, a wider, very large population of morally salient entities out there as well that most people just don't really want to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I'll comment, comment on that in a second. I, I think I maybe is worth noting with respect to the tension between inter, intervening in an ecosystem for the sake of improving wild animals' welfare, the tension between that and traditional views in environmental ethics. I think a lot of the tension is traceable to the fact that the environmental forms of biocentrism tend to have an implicit naturalism, or not, and not naturalism of the sort that you're interested yeah. in, but an implicit sort of uh, naturocentrism in them. The concern tends to be specifically with- If something's I, natural, it's good. Yeah. Yeah, natural ecosystems, natural forms of non-sentient life, and naturally occurring species. Okay, mm -hmm. so, and so if you were, to, you could imagine lots of non-natural versions of these things, and some of them exist. Ecosystems in cities are non-natural ecosystems. We could create species using genetic technology or what have you, and I don't know hybrids that would be new species or what have mm -hmm. you. Actually, we do that with uh, people breed breed animals and create new. And I don't think that any of these views are really interested in protecting these sorts of non-natural. Uh, and uh, things, not natural species, not natural ecosystems. They're very, they tend to be natural, natural centric. If you were to ha hold these environmental views, but remove the natural centrism, it's not so clear that there's a tension anymore. So I think re the real tension is this natural, it comes from natural centrism. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, but so with respect to, yeah, how do I get into animal suffering? I think, for, I think for a lot of vegans and animal activists and animal ethicists, it's not that's something that came later. So they initially went vegan and adopted sentiocentrism. And then later on, after reading maybe a paper by Oscar Orta or one of Brian Tomasic's blogs or something like that. Yeah. They then realized that, wait a second, nature is way worse for animals than we thought. What, what does that mean? What do I have to do? I have to change any of my views about what we owe to wild animals. Uh, it wasn't like that for me. When I took um, that class with Will Kimlicka, that was an introduction to me for, to animal ethics, but also to questions about wild animal suffering, because one of the chapters in, in the book Zoopolis was about the harms wild animals face and what we should make of them. And yeah. so I started, I, I thought they talk about different communities of animals and wild animals are, you know, front and center in that conversation right up front. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, and they were reacting to some interventionist type views in, in that book. They wanted to argue that intervening in, in nature in order to prevent predation or to control wild animal populations is wrong because they think it, it interferes with a wild animals collective agency. And so they think respect requires not doing that kind of interference. Mm -hmm. But uh, and we can get into why I think that's wrong if you, if you want. But, um, but the thing I was just trying to say right now is that I started thinking about wild animal suffering at the same time I started thinking about animal ethics. Yeah, and so they just went right in hand with me. When I became a sentiocentrist and went vegan, I was also thinking at the exact same time about wild animal suffering and what its moral implications are. And so they haven't, hand, it was hand in hand for me. Yeah, it's yeah, interesting. And, it's, and I think you're right with most people, it is more of a sequential thing. You start out with a, right, we have a companion animal dog in our family that I care about that can clearly suffer, that is morally salient. Why not pigs? And that's a journey that people have to work through or chickens or fish. People have to sometimes work through the species boundaries and the unfamiliarity boundaries as well and go, hold on, these things matter too. And then there's almost a separate jump where they go, okay, for pig can suffer and is morally salient, why not, why not a wild boar or the trillions of animals living out in the world? And it's almost like a sequential journey. And it's odd in a way that more people don't make those jumps more quickly because you'd think once you've made one of those jumps, you've broken a sort of social indoctrination or a set of categories that have been constructed you right. know, to compartmentalize different entities. Once you've recognized that you'd be able to bust through them much more quickly in a way you did that in one go. Yeah. So it's an interesting parallel. You've answered the question, what, what matters morally in terms of consideration is all sentient beings. And that's almost regardless of which category you might choose to put them in. Humans, non you know, non-human farmed animals, wild animals, if it's sentient, it matters. To get a little bit more sci-fi, I don't think any non-biological sentient being exists at the moment, but conceptually, I don't see why it's not possible. So again, other sentientists will disagree. Sentientism doesn't say this is what sentience is. So people have different views, but my personal view is it's a, really a class of advanced information processing that evolved because it was evolutionarily useful to be able to develop a model of ourselves and the environment and other agents in the environment and that there was also some evolutional value to 
a sense of valence that took us towards good things and away from bad things. So in a simple sense, I think that's what sentience is. But in, so if it is just information processing in concept, you, know, you could imagine it countering alien species or artificially intelligent creations that we design ourselves. Do you, to touch on the sci-fi angle for a moment, do you have a similar view or do you think, no, it has to be in a biological substrate? Yeah, I don't know what to think about that exactly. Which pr- might well be the best answer. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, wish I, knew, I wish I knew more about philosophy of mind, and then I, I could answer this question uh, more intelligently. I've got a few brilliant uh, philosophy of mind interviews coming up as well. So I just interviewed Richard yeah. Brown. I haven't released it, but yeah, he's, that's an awesome conversation. But there's, yeah, that's one of the things I love about these conversations is that I'm so able to span across disciplines. And I think a lot of people in the animal ethics world and different fields of philosophy could, you know, learn a great deal from philosophy of mind stuff as well. I think there's some dead ends in there as well, but, and some weird thinking, but yeah, it's interesting. Well, one thing that you, so I think this, this is presupposing your question though. So I've, yeah, I think I'm, I have some familiarity with effective altruism and the concerns yeah. that effective altruists raise about different things. I'm something of an effective altruist myself, but I, I don't know how strongly I identify, I, I identify with the movement. I think I probably have to donate a bunch of my money to be like a real effective altruist. I'm, I'm not doing that <laughs> at the moment, but I am, I think that the concerns that motivate effective altruists are the same concerns that motivate my work on wild animal suffering. I was attracted yeah. To the problem because it's a massive scale problem. There are far more wild animal individuals born into the world than anything else, like by many orders of magnitude. Yeah. And also, um, even if various wild animals are not sentient, I still think it's the case that the vast majority of sentient individuals that are born are wild animals who are living very short, terrible lives because they're um, members of our strategist species who you know, uh, protect their genes by producing huge numbers of offspring. And the, the sheer scale, so the sheer scale of this problem, just the vast majority of sentient individuals are living these very short, painful lives, combined with the fact that hardly anyone's really doing serious work on it. And that's changing, but it's still the case that it's, it's yeah. relative to the scale of the problem. It's a very neglected area of research. That's what attracted me to the problem. And those are the same considerations that that effective altruists appeal to. Yeah. Um, but, but anyway, oh, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll let you go if you want. Um, and and the, third, the third thing that we'll come on to in a minute is um, the third criteria effective altruists often uses tractability. Is yeah. there something we can do about this or not? And I think you probably see animals suffering is another area that's highly tractable too, given your work. Yeah. Yeah. I think tractability is stickier than, so the other, the first two criteria very clearly support prioritizing wild animal suffering and tractability. It's the, whatever support tractability might lend is less clear. There does, there do seem to be other problems that are arguably more tractable. So there's, yeah, there's a, but actually I think the the fact that tractability is a bit unclear is actually a really good reason to do research because we'll figure out tractability over the course of doing research. I think right now, the extent to which wild animal suffering is tractable is a bit unclear. And to, to get that, get clear on that, we need to do more research, such as research on welfare biology, which is- Because we might find a massive tractable opportunity that we're not currently aware of or, you know, yeah. or not. So yeah, more research required. And I'm actually myself fairly optimistic about tractability, but I also realize that there might be problems that I just, I'm not seeing or whatever. But so I, I yeah, I talk a lot about, I, it's funny, I was going to try and connect this stuff to AI. Maybe I'll get back to AI in a moment. <laughs> yeah, no, I, so I, in my, my own work, I talk a lot about gene drives and how gene drives could be a useful way of not just reducing wild animal suffering, but reducing it on a very large scale. Mm. And right now, gene drives don't have enough traction in the public mind, probably, to be something that it would make sense for advocacy groups to be advocating for. I think too many people find the idea of using gene drives to be counterintuitive for advocacy groups to be really focusing their advocacy related efforts on promoting the use of gene drives. But I think that may change over time, especially once we start using gene drives in anthropocentric ways, once we've hopefully tried to wipe out malaria, once it becomes safe to do, yeah. once these sorts of things happen, start happening, people will become used to gene drives. They'll stop seeing it as this weird, unnatural thing that, or, that messes around with ecosystems. And we'll start saying that, yeah, we can use them safely. Once that happens, it'll be easier to advocate for gene drives. And some, there are some ways of using gene drives that just seem to me to be very promising. I'd want people to test them and do research on them first before launching a gene drive. But so for example, I, I know you've talked to David Pierce before, and he has, yeah. he has some interesting views about, about the use of gene drives. But one sort of very modest, sort of Piercean way of using a gene drive to help wild animals would be to just temporarily remove wild animals' capacity, not, uh, remove the, the extent to which, or reduce the extent to which wild animals are bothered by their pain. And I, and, and I, I have in mind something that would be temporary. So our strategists are the vast majority of wild animals that are born into the world. And they have this vulnerable period in life where it, within the first few weeks or months, they're very likely to experience various harms and then die from one of those harms very mm. early on. So they're presumably living a pretty crappy life during that period of time. And most of them will just die during that period of time. 
if we could just make it the case that all of those bad experiences are less bad for them because they they aren't as bothered by them. In other words, some cognitive scientists distinguish between the effective dimension of pain and the sensory dimension of pain. If we can keep it the case that they have the sensory experience of pain and some of the aversive behaviors associated with that, but that they're less bothered by their pain, mm-hmm. the effective dimension to some extent, then the crappiness of their lives will be reduced dramatically. And, it'll, and if we can do this across a lot of our strategist species, it would have a massive impact on the amount of suffering uh, in nature. It would just and is it fair mass- to say that, d- that doing that, w- would an analog be that rather than it being there's a sensation or a stimulus, an experiencing of suffering, and then a response, that you could almost cut out the middle, the middleman, if you like, and almost make it work more like a thermostat where there's a stimulus and a response, but there's no experiencing or there's no effective. Yeah, so that's, that's, not, that's a good question. And that's actually a little different from what I'm talking about. That one, that is, that is, but this is one possibility to try and keep aversive behavior and yet remove suffering at the same time. Yeah. You could try and just um, amp up nociception. So nociception is just the cognitive equipment we have that lets us instinctively respond to negative stimuli. Mm-hmm. And, and it doesn't have to be accompanied by a, a conscious experience. It could just be an instinctive reaction to negative stimuli. We could try and amp up nociception. But I, I think, I'm, I, don't, I'm not, I don't know enough about evolution and about aversive behaviors to know, to say this with a whole lot of certainty, but I'm a little skeptical that nociception by itself would be enough to retain animals' adapted behaviors, right? So I worry that only nociception alone would lead to ecosystemic consequences that would be quite bad a lot of animals might end up going extinct or what have you but if so what the proposal would be to not remove conscious experiences but only remove the extent to which bad experiences are, are bothersome to the animals who experience them the term that's often used for this would be to make it the case that animals feel mere pain rather than suffering so you know they'd have a it'd be a little bit like they're experiencing lots of aches and pains but nothing excruciating yeah over so you sort of dial down the affect or yeah, the right. intensity exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah okay interesting yeah. thank you and I think Chris has uh, talked about a gene he, that he, I can't remember the name of the gene, but there's a particular gene that we can influence that affects the extent to which affect, uh, that influences the effective dimension of pain. Yeah. Um, and and uh, we, a number of studies have been done where we've actually, and I, I don't know about the ethics of these studies, but they're probably questionable, but mice have been produced that lack the effective dimension of pain. They only have the sensory experience of pain. So we actually already know how to do this. We've already done research where we've produced animals through gene editing where they don't have the effective dimension of pain anymore or, or where, where they experience pain at least far, m- m- less acutely. Yeah. And, it's, and there's a few things in that space where it, it sounds quite sci-fi, but actually we're not far off having the technology to do it with CRISPR and with the, the knowledge we already have. So yeah. I guess we've, that's been a nice link into the, this final subject I like to talk about here, which is what, what's the vision of the future? And in a way, it's a sort of odd situation because most of the people on the planet have a sort of, in some sense, a non-naturalistic or a supernatural worldview. And most people on the planet, while they might agree with us conceptually about not wanting to needlessly cause harm, have massive exclusions in terms of their moral consideration, whether it's wild animals or farmed animals or even some humans, as we know. So we've got this sort of strange situation where I think taking a generally naturalistic approach and having a sentiocentric compassion seems a fairly solid stance that leaves lots of detail to work out, but it seems quite solid. But most people on the planet disagree with this. Part of the conversation we close on is thinking about in that context, if you could imagine a more utopian future where more humans were more naturalistic and more rational and also had a more generous compassion that was, you know, spanned a sentiocentric scope, what could that future look like? And you've started laying out for wild animals some of the aspects of what that more compassionate lower suffering future could look like. Are there other elements of a utopian future beyond sort of gene drives that you, that you might envisage for wild animals? What, yeah. what, what would the other themes be maybe? Well, yeah, so yeah, obviously I think, yeah, gene, using gene drives to increase the w- average level of welfare in ecosystems would be something to aspire to do. And that I think as long as there's enough political will and research money, it's something we probably we could do in the future. Yeah. Um, and again, but, like you said earlier on, if we can keep chapping chipping away at that sort of nature fallacy. And I, I think it, it's sensible. We need to be cautious about our own hubris and are cautious about our own capability. And we have so much evidence of you know, negative interventions that it's not really a question of whether we should intervene. It's a question of we already are. So how should we change how we intervene? So I understand that hesitation, but at the same time, it seems a deep shame for that hesitation to let us you know, throw up our hands and just remove moral consideration from vast swathes of suffering beings at the same time. It seems crazy yeah. just to give up. And I think so I can talk about some other stuff in a bit if you want. But w- one reason that sometimes effective altruists don't fully appreciate for intervening to improve wild animals' welfare is just that, and it's a very de- deontological sort of reason. We, so we, we're living in this Anthropocene right now where collective human behavior 
is the main thing influencing the natural world right now. And a, a lot of people think this. And uh, so we're, our collective behavior is dramatically or pervasively impacting the size of wild animal populations, which wild animal, pop, animal populations shrink, which ones increase in size. We're dr- having a dramatic effect on which animals go extinct or which ones don't. And along well, aside all of that is a, is a series of harms that would be the explanation for why animal populations are going up or down or going extinct or not. Animals don't go extinct for no reason. It's because they're either being preyed upon more or their resources are being deprived. And so they're starving to death. Like these are the sorts of things that cause it. And human behavior is the main reason or the main causal factor that's affecting the populations in these ways. And if we have a sentiocentric perspective, there's good reason there to think that therefore we owe duties of justice to wild animals, that because we've we're pervasively affecting them. We have a moral obligation to either rectify some of those harms mm-hmm. or to extend egalitarian norms to them such that we should be concerned with the fact that they're doing so much worse off than us. And we're having this pervasive effect on them and they're so much worse off than us. Arguably, we should be concerned We should be concerned with the fact that they're so much worse off than us, given that we're entangled with them. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we don't have the same kind of community with wild animals that we do with domesticated animals because we, we don't breed wild animals. But if we're pervasively impacting them, that's a very important kind of entanglement that arguably generates duties of justice. Yeah. And, and so there, I think there's good, not, it's, there's not just consequentialist uh, utilitarian considerations for involved, for getting into, into nature and trying to help wild animals. And there's also these duties of justice. And, and also, even if was, those weren't there, but there's a, ro- there's a role for bit considerations of beneficence in any deontological framework too. That's interesting because it's, it's okay. laying out a sort of a hopeful view of the positive impact we might be able to have in terms of wild animals experience as well. And again, I'm an amateur in the field, but it's interesting for me because while there are certain things about gene drives and and some more technologically advanced things that we could imagine doing that I think research will um, help us explore you know, yeah. reasonably quickly, there's also some very pragmatic, immediate things that are going on today as well. And I don't know what your thoughts are about the effectiveness or the usefulness of those, whether it's about switching from culling to contraception as a means of managing wild populations or fencing or helping wild animals have access to different areas or coping with how humans and wild animals live together. There's quite a, it strikes me that some people will look at wild animal suffering and say it's like a crazily esoteric, futuristic thing to even think about. But actually, there's some remarkably pragmatic work that's going on right now that already has real impact, positive impact for wild animals. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that, and actually my own, my own advice to uh, people who are working in advocacy groups is that it makes sense to focus on the kind of stuff that, that we're already doing that's yeah. probably helping wild animals a lot. And a lot of these things are, are currently being done for anthropocentric reasons, but we know enough about them that we know that they're safe and that they're probably helping wild animals too. So one, one good example of this is um, wild animal vaccination programs. There are wild animal vaccination programs in various parts of the world. Mm. So in North America, for example, wild animal rabies vaccination programs are very common. And the reason for vaccinating wild animals against rabies are the reasons that are uh, motivating the vaccination are anthropocentric reasons. Uh, yeah. Also have rabies threaten the health of domesticated animals and of human beings. But presumably these rabies vaccinations are helping the wild animals who are vaccinated and thereby don't end up getting rabies afterwards. Yeah. And, uh, and environmental impact assessments were done. Presumably these rabies vaccinations are, are safe. They're widespread, relatively uncontroversial. They're done in a non-invasive way a lot of the time too. They're done through feeding stations rather than through darts or whatever. So they seem like just a good thing to be doing for us, but also for animals too. Yeah, And there's other examples too, that well, one really interesting one that was discussed in an op-ed produced by, written by a geneticist named Kevin Esfeld. Now he, so this is going to sound, I, I guess, more sci-fi-ish, but it's not exactly. But one thing that was done in North America that probably had an absolutely massive, massively positive impact on, on wild animal welfare was the elimination of screw fly, screw fly populations in North America. So something called, there's this bug called the screw fly that doesn't exist in North America anymore, but it still exists in South America and in various parts of Asia. Th- this bug called the screw fly is a parasite that mostly plagues mammals. And what it does is it lays eggs in open, mam- this is nasty stuff, it lays eggs in, eggs in open mammalian wounds. Those eggs hatch and larvae then eat the flesh of the mammal that they're attached to. Those larvae, they eat, a while, they eat for a while, they eventually fatten up and leave. But when they do, they release a pheromone that attracts other screw flies to the wound. And so it just ends up being this sick cycle and yeah. animals who get this infection, it's, it's painful, it's debilitating, and they usually die from it eventually. Ab- one of the most atrocious ways that an animal could die is through screw fly, screw fly infections. Yeah, it's it's awful. And, ter- and the animals who are being affected are mammals, so they're obviously suffering a lot. Screw flies were eliminated using something called the sterile insect technique back around the year 2000 in North America. 
And the reasons for doing it were anthropocentric. So the screw flies were most, the main reason was that negatively affecting farmers' profits because yeah. domesticated farmed animals were being, were being killed by screw fly infections. But it's not domesticated farmed animals that were the main victims of screw flies. It was wild mammals. It was mostly, and, and there's actually been stuff written about how deer populations back when screw flies were pervasive, deer populations were being pervasively affected by screw flies. They were being decimated by screw fly infections. And yeah, I think this, like, this kind of intervention is really, is really interesting because it was done for anthropocentric reasons and the, the benefits for wild animals were accidental, but they were huge and largely yeah. unappreciated by really anyone. And I, you know, presumably we could just do more of this. We could just do more pa- non-sentient parasite control, not for our own sake, but for wild animals' sake. And as long as we did some environmental impact assessments, we were careful about it. It's hard to see what would be the problem with either eliminating certain non-sentient parasite populations or at least reducing the, the size of those populations so that they're less pesky to the animals that they plague. Uh, these, these seem like obvious things and we wouldn't need to use gene editing to do it, though we could use gene editing to try and do yeah. it because we know it might be more effective. Um, That's a fascinating example. Because I think you're right. Many people look at wild animal suffering and just think it's just too hard to even engage with. But I think you've made it very clear that one, the moral case for consideration is crystal clear, right? They're sentient beings that suffer just like anything else. But also there's some really hope, help, hopeful stories there about what things we're already doing, have already done, sometimes by accident for different different reasons and developing technology that could give us a you know, radically better outcome for them. And just linking back to the earlier part of our conversation, talking about religion, it's you know, amusing because when Jehovah's Witnesses come and visit me, they've quite often got a brochure that has this utopian future state where there's a lamb and a lion and a rabbit and humans living around a lake in perfect peace and harmony and universal compassion. But they've never explained how that's actually going to come about. Whereas your work is actually technically thinking about <laughs> ways we might be able to make that Come, come to pass. Yeah. Maybe you're going to be delivering a Jehovah's Witness utopian future for us also. <laughs> but there's some other big chunks, obviously, in this thinking about the future space and the wild animal suffering one is neglected. So it's been brilliant to cover that with you. Are there any other thoughts you've got about, I guess, the more obvious mainstream tasks around farmed animals and fishing and how you see that space developing towards a better future, but also maybe even in intrahuman ethics and whether some of these things we've talked about can complement development in human intrahuman ethics or whether there's trade-offs there. Are there any things you wanted to layer into the conversation about your utopian future you're building for us? So I'm going to be sneaky with this and, and yeah, we can get back to the real stuff that you want to talk about maybe after I do the sneaky thing. Okay. So I think, I think veganism really matters. And there are lots of people who thought way more about how to get other people to go vegan, how, how to maybe design institutions in a way that makes going vegan easier, r- makes it easier for farmers to transition towards plant-based farming and away from uh, either dairy farming or animal agriculture. Diverting subsidies is one, one great thought that's out there. Yeah. But, there's, but lots of people thought way more about this than I have, and, and maybe they can speak more intelligently about it. One thing that I think that's really important to note about veganism are two, two things. One is that I think Veganism is very closely connected to caring about wild animal suffering. I think so. I think that there's yeah. well, the process of going vegan. It's partly a philosophical process. But you think about animals and the fact that they're sentient and about what we might owe to them in light of that's no- a normal part of the process for at least a lot of vegans, not all vegans. But it's also a, a process where you're, you end up bringing your lifestyle in line with your moral beliefs. Because there's lots of people who would say that animals matter a lot. Sentience, they might say sentience, they might even say they're sentiocentric, but they haven't gone vegan and they're not bringing their pra- their personal practices in line with their beliefs. Yeah. And um, when you fail to do that, I think there's various things involved, but one is that you're probably not really actually thinking about animals that much because there's so much cognitive dissonance that you're probably shutting down your compassion uh, yeah. for animals to some extent. If we go vegan, you, you can, you're now free to really start thinking about animals a little bit. And I, I think that this process, this philosophical plus practical process, makes one much more likely to care about wild animal suffering when you encounter it. As someone who's gone yeah. vegan for the right moral reasons is much more likely to think that animals, wild animal suffering is a big problem when they encounter it than someone who hasn't bothered. So I think there's a, a connection here. Like Going vegan is great for its own sake and for the sake of trying to boycott animal agriculture and remove the support that you're personally that you personally provide to animal agriculture when you pay for animal products. Yeah. But another thing it does is it just, I think as a social movement, it's, it's prepping people to care, give a crap about wild animal suffering. So that's one thing I think that's important to note. But yeah, another I agree. Thing that's important to note, I think as well is, and this I think maybe is, is not appreciated by everyone yet. I was, and I, I should credit Sue Donaldson for bringing my, bringing this to my attention because I had a discussion with her about it. When supposing that we, that the vegan social movement is successful 
most people go vegan, animal agriculture starts to basically collapse or to be reformed in really significant ways or whatever. Once that happens, we're going to have a lot of land available. So uh, there's all this land that's currently being used to just grow feed crop. That's just to just grow crops that are used to feed animals. Yeah. You could, as I understand it, if we did a complete transition from animal agriculture to plant agriculture, you could probably free up like almost two thirds of agricultural land globally. It's absolutely incredible and still get the same nutritional output. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know what the exact stats myself or whatever, but it's a huge amount of, yeah. like the, the, my impression is that the majority of agricultural lands are currently used to produce feed for, for animals. I so, think it's, I think it's yeah. something for land use. It's something like 77% of the global agricultural land is used for animal ag, including the feed. And that generates 18% of the calories and 32% of the protein. Okay. Something okay. like that. So again, if you just do the maths and work it around and say, okay, let's switch that to plants. That's that's why you get that we can free up that much land. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to have all this land free and we're going to need to think about what to do with it. And I think yeah. um, what a lot of people are saying right now are like the most common response to what should we do with this land is we should re- rewild this land. Yeah. If we haven't thought about wild animal suffering when it comes time to rewild these huge, this huge, these huge tracts of land, or, or just to make a decision about what to do with them, there's an excellent chance we will be doing irresponsible things. We, because basically, when you rewild, you're creating an ecosystem. Yeah. And uh, when you're creating an ecosystem, you're making decisions that will have a huge impact for lives that you're causally and morally responsible for bringing about. And it'd be really bad if we just created ecosystems where wild animals are typically living very bad lives. Wild, so ecosystems that have, for example, lots of predators and lots large predator populations and large R strategist populations. Yeah. Presumably ecosystems like that are not going to be ecosystems where wild animals are typically living good lives. So we really need to think about what kind of ecosystems would we want to create when we, when we rewild, assuming that we can even rewild in a morally permissible way. I'm going to make that assumption that there is some morally permissible way of rewilding. Yeah. But uh, we really need to think about that. And that, that, that shows that right now, thinking about wild animal suffering is actually really important because we don't want, to get to, we don't want veganism to be successful and get to the point where, where we're rewilding and then, do it ba- and then do it really badly. Yeah, we've created a new problem by solving another one. And some of that solution might be in some of the technical innovations. You've talked about gene drives and so on. Yeah. But my, my, my guess is that even in the ecosystems that evolve today, there are radically different profiles of, I don't know how you'd measure it, whether you call it suffering density or in intensity, depending on the yeah. food chains or, or the nature there as well. So that's, that's an important area to think about. Thank you. And I think th- there's a theme there as well about unintended consequences, but there's also a theme there that you talked about with veganism and wild animal suffering, that broadening our moral consideration, to me, just has positive complementary effects. It helps us go further. And personally, I think it's good for us as humans too. We can resolve that cognitive dissonance. So there are anthropocentric reasons why we should have broader compassion as well as the more altruistic reasons too. But one and maybe I should let you escape soon. But one other challenge that we'll face when we're talking about non-human animal ethics, whether it's wild animal suffering or animal farming, is we've got enough problems within the human species, war and poverty and inequality and discrimination and so on. We need to focus there first. We can't afford to think more generously about non-humans at this point. And it's something you'll, you know, I quite often hear, if not as an explicit statement, as a default pattern of behavior. You, so there are some of the giants in the human rights field who really revolutionized the way we as a species think generously about each other, still have practically zero mental or emotional space for thinking about the suffering of non-humans. So how do you respond to that challenge? And, and again, do you think there's a sort of complementarity there for humans about us right. being more generous in our moral consideration? Yeah, no, I, I do think there is. I think I'd, I'd have a two sort of two phase response, one of which was just meant to be philosophical, the other of which would be more pragmatic. The philosophical response would just be that, listen, domesticated farmed animals outnumber us by a huge amount. I think in animal agriculture, something like 70 billion animals are killed every year. Most of those animals are in factory farms. So not only are they being killed, but they're living just atrocious lives. And that's just if the you, land animals. Yeah. Okay. I'm not even taking aquaculture or anything into, yeah, I'm not even taking aquaculture into consideration with that or the effects of industrial fishing on, on, on fish who, various fish who are affected by that. This is just a, it's a massive scale problem. Animal agriculture is a massive scale problem in part because of the numbers of animals it affects, but also the severity of the effects. Like the lives these animals are living are very bad lives. It's really speciesist to just think that because 
there are lots of human problems. We just need to prioritize them regardless of how many, the number of individuals involved or the extent to which they're affected by the relevant problem. That kind of prioritization is just straightforwardly speciesist, I think. So I think I'd say that. And I'd also point out that uh, actually once, so moving past domesticated animals to wild animals, the scale of that's even bigger. Scale, the wide scale of wild animal suffering is even bigger than the scale of the problem posed by animal agriculture, because the numbers of our strategists and whatnot being born into the world, and also just wild animals in general, are probably in the, they're in the trillions or something like that. It's just like mind boggling numbers. And they're typically living pretty bad lives, especially these our strategists infants who are the vast majority of the animals out there. So again, let's just try not to be speciesist here. Let's just note that these problems deserve a high level of priority. But then more pragmatically, I would say, okay, because I I assume that a lot of people will just be like, human beings just matter more than animals. They just won't, they'll come up with some kind of objection Mm. here. I think I'd point out, yeah, I'd point out that pragmatically speaking, if we address animal problems, this is going to do things that, that will be helpful for human beings too. So with respect to farmed animals in particular, if we can get rid of factory farming, for example, that's going to be um, great for the environment, which is great for us. And it's going to dramatically reduce the chances of another global pandemic. It will, those are the two main, those are the, okay, those are the two main kind of obvious yeah. uh, uh, positive. Anti- mi- antimicrobial resistance can get added to the list. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So th- th- there's that. But then also, I, so I haven't looked at the psychological studies or anything like that, but, I, I, but I'm pretty sure that people who, who are sentiocentric and who make their, pre- make their behavior consistent with sentiocentrism, they tend, they, 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 that, that tends to have a, like a broad range of effects on their behavior and on their psychology. And I think one of the most obvious ones is that they tend to be less prejudiced people because they're overcoming one of the main, most significant sources of prejudice that there is. Once you've gotten to the point where you're including animals in the moral community fully and, be, can, and can, making your behavior and your beliefs consistent with that, it's really hard to then go off and be, or it's not, I don't know, I suppose you could still be sexist or racist or what have you, but you're much less likely to mm. be sexist or racist. Um, and I, I, so this is an, there's an empirical question here about, about the relationship between them, but I think there is some, there is some kind of relationship there. And People I think there is, an, and, I, and you said it already, but I think it, it almost comes in two parts. One is the recognition of the moral salience of the experience of another. And if you can do that for someone of a different species, surely you can do that for all humans, almost trivially. Yeah. But the other one is that breaking through the cognitive dissonance and being you know, willing to make the commitment to actually make some changes to bring yourself yeah. more closely in line with your ethics. And both of those two things seem to have a positive correlation for me, for intrahuman yeah. ethics as well. Yeah. yeah that's right. And I, I like to joke that there's no escape from veganism because if you only care about humans, you need to go vegan because of climate change, antimicrobial resistance, and uh, zoonotic disease. If you care about, if you genuinely believe that plants are sentient or you think uh, all plants should have moral consideration, you still need to go vegan because you need to feed 10 times as many plants through animals for food than if you ate them directly. So you still need mm-hmm. to go vegan. So there's no escape. There's no escape. Whatever your philosophical excuse or your moral scope I might be a little bit self serving. <laughs> I think you're giving bio. Okay, I don't want to piss off biocentrists, but you're giving them a little too much credit here because, um, again, so many of them are natu- have this naturocentric yeah. yeah. version of biocentrism that they buy into, and so I don't think that grown plants grown in agriculture would have moral considerability for them because they're sneaking in naturocentrism into their yeah. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree. That's been fascinating. Thank you for investing so much time. You've painted a. a f- a fascinating sort of personal philosophical story and given us some ideas for a more compassionate, rational future as well. And yeah, thank you so much for your work because it, it does feel like you're pretty relentlessly following evidence, reason, and a broad compassion wherever it leads, even when it has to bust through some pretty deeply held traditions and taboos. So yeah, it's much appreciated. Is there anything else you'd like to layer into the conversation before we wrap up and I'll let you escape? No, I don't. I think at some point I wanted to say something about AI, but oh, uh, yeah. do we have time to even say anything about AI? Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. No, just, just an offhand comment. Um, yeah. So I, I think I started talking about effective altruism. A lot of effective altruists think that AI is something we really need to be thinking about because they think that it's reasonably likely or predictable that we'll develop sentient artificial intelligence. Yeah. It's going to happen. And they worry that we'll develop a lot of sentient artificially, a lot of artificial sentient beings. There'll be a very large number of them potentially. And, uh, and if we haven't thought about the fact about the importance of sentience and, and including those beings in the moral community, we'll mistreat them in lots of ways. So, so Leading to S risks or suffering risks. Yeah. S risks, exactly. Yeah. yeah. This is an interesting problem. And I mentioned that I, I don't know enough about philosophy of mind to be able to speak too intelligently about it, but it do, I think it's worth noting that it does seem to depend on certain views in the philosophy of mind. This, this worry depends on holding some kind of view about the possibility for the development of sentience. So it at least maintains that biological, that, that we, it's not a necessary condition that sentience emerge from some sort of biological basis. It could emerge from some non-biological basis. Yeah. I don't know if that makes, is that, I'm not sure what the word for that is. If there's, is there a philosophy of mind term for that? So I, yeah, I'm not sure, but I think 
there there are different schools of thought because for for some people and panpsychism is one example of this they think that consciousness and sentience are ultimately all pervasive and maybe even the foundation of reality itself so in an extreme sense they think that uh, consciousness is present in you know every single entity even um, some schools of panpsychists thought even down to sort of fundamental physics particles photons and electrons and so on in some very minimal sense have some form of consciousness. And so they're almost saying that every form of information processing, even sort of atomic level, is in some sense aware or has some conscious experience. I don't subscribe to that view at all. Some other sentientists do. My sense is that for biological entities, as I mentioned before, I think the way sentience came about wasn't because single-celled entities have some infused sentience within them because of the electrons and the atoms that they're made up of and that comes together, I think sentience developed as a class of information processing probably around or maybe just before the Precambrian because for biological early animals, it became useful to be able to model the environment, model the self and to sense a valence that moved you towards things in a way for others. So I think that's the, the causal story that seems the most feasible to me about where biological sentience came from. But having said that, I do think it is just a class of information processing. So whereas a panpsychist would say, all information processing is conscious. I would say, no, no, only a subset of information processing is conscious in the way that not all information processing is PowerPoint, right? It's like a specific class of information processing that does a thing. Um, so on the one hand, my personal perspective is that because it is just information processing, you could recreate that in an artificial okay. substrate, but I don't think it would happen by accident. You'd, I think you'd actually have to design it in or... D- or evolve the artificial intelligence in a context where it was evolutionarily useful for it to develop sentience. I don't think it would happen by magic. So you might be able to design in the subroutines that said that, that instantiate experiencing, or you might have some genetically algorithm driven approach that is an analog of evolution that leads to something that's, you know, evolves sentience. But I don't think you'd find it by accident in a sort of non-player character in a computer game or a, or an algorithm that's, doing right. you know, some sort of machine learning and so on. Okay, but yeah. again, that's a, just a sort of personal view about, I think it's conceptually possible, but I think you'd actually have to, there'd have to be a reason for it to come into being. It wouldn't be. Right. Yeah. The, the reason I'm asking is just because it seems to me that this worry, the, the S risk worry about artificial intelligence has a lot of assumptions built into it. And I'd want to, I'd want to unpack all of those assumptions. I want to see what, what it's assuming about the philosophy of mind and yeah. what it's this, and also here what it's assuming about the likelihood of, of yeah of sentience emerging accidentally or or, per, or per, purposively if it's accidental then yeah it seems like a much bigger worry if a bunch of video games are out there that just have characters that are sentient that could just end up being a huge problem or something like that i don't know tons of yeah. characters that we don't even recognize as sentient and we're treating them in bad ways or something but if it's intentional i don't know if the if the escrit, the likelihood of this escrit developing is is as bad I mean, so if we know we're creating sentient beings this is something we're doing intentionally. There, there's, I, I don't know. It seems more likely that ethical decision making would be feet, would be a part of the process that that people would have to go through to create these sentient beings. We'd want that decision making to be sentiocentric and not like welfareist, like the sort of decision making we see on animal welfare committees. That would be yeah. a really good thing, I think. But yeah, anyways, I'd, I'd want to unpack. I'd want to unpack all this stuff because I, I think I've heard you say before that you think this is a bit of a distraction, an intellectual distraction, to be thinking too much about the possibility of an artificial intelligence S risk. And that's been my impression too, but I can't justify my impression super well. But I think some of what we've said right now maybe justifies that a little bit. Uh, but yeah. And, is- and, and I think we should, uh, it comes back to some of your points around wild animal suffering as well. We should be, I think we should be, and this is part of the idea behind naturalism being an important part of this worldview is that we shouldn't overestimate our knowledge about the world or our knowledge about what's morally either. We should develop beliefs about the world provisionally, probabilistically, and where they have an impact on sentient beings, we should be, we should be prudent. And that, and I think that should apply to artificial entities as well, because I don't think there's a in principle reason why they couldn't experience suffering. But I guess the way I think of it, come back to that sort of the thermostat, analogy in that a thermostat senses the temperature and then it turns the boiler on and off but there's no subroutines or information processing anywhere in that process that is experiencing things so i think an imp- a non-player character in a video in a shoot 'em up video game is like that because you can look at the code and you can see what it's doing so i think it's more like a thermostat than it is a, an entity but right. having said that the bits in my brain that are doing the experiencing, I don't think are magic. They are just information processing as well. But I do think they're a distinct thing, you know, a connected thing, but they are 
not they're not the same stuff as just the sense and just the motor or even just the logic and there is something there's a class of information processing that, that consciousness and sentience is and it's yeah. not all pervasive but again other sentientists will disagree but that's also quite interesting because you might think and again this might be a bit of a weird tangent to go down but you might think if someone can be sentiocentric but think that ultimately everything is sentient, what does that mean for their morality? And what most people will do is they'll say some sentiocentrists, again, this is another example where it's neutral and irritatingly neutral on many topics, but some sentiocentrists take quite an egalitarian view and say, look, if something's sentient, it should be granted to equal moral consideration, almost regardless of its nature. Most other sentientists, including me, will say, look, if sentience is a class of information processing, I think it's almost inconceivably rich and varied. Even the human experience is breathtakingly rich and varied. So I can, I am open to the idea that you might grade moral consideration in certain ways and you might take a deontological approach or a consequentialist approach or whatever. But there are different ways you might grade moral consideration differently. And they then take that to the logical extent where they say, okay, if this electron is minimally sentient, it's sentient in such a vanishingly narrow way that it, it warrants such a tiny proportion of moral consideration. It, you know, it doesn't really count. So they argue it that way. But in, in, a, in another way, that's partly why I like focusing on sentience rather than consciousness, because if someone wants to declare that an electron is conscious, I would still argue it's not sentient because there's no way that electron can actually experience suffering or flourishing because it doesn't have any information processing architecture. Yeah. And frankly, you can't really do anything to an electron anyway. And for photons, time doesn't even pass. So the whole concept seems crazy to me. But <laughs> I think that's how panpsychist sentiocentrists rationalize holding on to a morality that still accords more value to non-human and human animals that are very obviously sentient in a traditional way. But yeah. Fascinating topics. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. I should let you go. It's been an absolute whirlwind. It's been fascinating to talk to you. Thank you. And I'm really looking forward to reading your book as well. If I was a professional podcaster, I would have read your book first. Such is life. I'll have to read it afterwards. What's the best way of people following you, learning about your work, buying your book? I can include links in the show notes, of course, but where would you point people? Yeah, sure. I have a, a profile page on academia.edu and a profile page on Phil People. And so I post a lot of my work on there, or at least work that I can post. I can't post like copies of my books on there, but I can yeah. post article, like pre-published drafts of articles and stuff like that. With respect to the book, yeah, you could probably access, I think you can access a link to, the, to Rutledge's landing yeah. page for my book if you go to either of my profile pages. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I'll include those links. And do you do social media much at all? Or are yeah, you so wise and stay off that? Facebook a bit, which is, uh, that's how we ended up connecting. Ended up yeah. Connecting. Great to have um, you on our group. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to be there. So I, yeah, I'm on Facebook pretty regularly. I'm thinking about getting onto Twitter, maybe, but I haven't decided yet. <laughs> yeah, you should. We should welcome you on there. It's a strange and wonderful world. Once you get used to what to ignore and block and mute, okay. uh, you okay. can have some fascinating conversations. So. Brilliant. I will let you get on with the rest of your day. Thank you again, Carl. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. Take care. Stay in touch.